asymptotically flat space time has a 2D CFT dual. Okay, so this is the basic statement of celestial holography. So what I'd do is that I'd try to motivate that why is such a connection between 4D gravitational theories and 2D CFT theories uh, should be there. And oh, okay, what is a CFT? Okay, so uh, that's a good question. So CFT is a quantum field theory. No, 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 what type of CFT? Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, th that's something uh, that uh, Partho will talk about. What kind of a CFT? I'll give you some idea of what uh, kind of a CFT we can expect. What I'll tell you is that you will see that it's not a not unitary CFT. And it's only for 42 degrees correspondence. Uh, you, no, it's not necessarily a 42 degree correspondence. So, okay, that's also. So the point is that Lorentz group in d dimensions. Sorry. Uh, what is uh, it should be one dimension lower. No, it should be one dimension lower for ADS spaces, right? So for ADS, you know that there is a ADS CFT CF correspondence. Holography. The basic idea of holography is that if you have a theory with gravity, mm -hmm. there is a dual theory of lower dimension without gravity that is dual to it, okay. right? So in in that sense, uh, a four D gravity having a 2D safety tool, you can think of it as a holographic state. Does that make sense? Just from a philosophical perspective, like yeah. usually I, uh, the holographic principle, that it was motivated from the fact that you have this area law for black holes. That is true. There, there you have a one dimension lower kind of a That is exactly true. So here, well, how, is there some, un, like something? Yeah, so it, that is exactly the discussion today, the philosophical motivation for this, which is super rotation symmetries, okay? So what we will see is that for, and I'm talking about gravity only in asymptotically flat space times where you can actually define an ACE matrix. So what we will see is that this ACE matrix in 4D will have this super rotation symmetry. And that super rotation symmetry is nothing but a Virasoro symmetry. I'll, I'll show that, okay. Uh, that is a controversial statement. I should say that it at least contains Virasoro symmetry. And because it contains Virasoro symmetry, we'd expect that there is some 2D CFT dual to it, okay? I try to motivate it uh, uh, if I get some time towards the end of the lecture that why you expect a 2D CFT to be there. But uh, yeah. Also, uh, this thing will also hold for uh, D dimension, right? So D dimension. Yeah, so as I was just saying, minus two exactly. Minus so that, that relation comes from the basic fact that the Lorentz group in d dimensions, which is SO d comma 1, okay? This is Lorentz group in two dimension d dimensions. This is also the same as the conformal group in d minus two dimensions, right? D plus one dimension and D minus one dimensions. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, usually when we do CFT, we use this correspondence to uh, do something called the embedding space formalism, right? But here we, we are doing the opposite thing. So when we do CFT, we use this embedding space formalism to construct a higher dimensional uh, so, sort of auxiliary space time, just so that our expressions look nice and uh, all that. But here the higher dimensional space time is actually the physical space time. And then we have a lower dimensional conformal group. So we know that there is a, a two dimension less CFT that, is, that corresponds to it, okay? Good. So I'll start where exactly uh, Chandramoli started, which is to talk about this, ah, sorry. Do I expect, yes, it's a Euclidean CFT, yes. In in uh, in here, no. That is. Yeah, exactly. So if this Klein space is, for instance, yeah, that will be it will be defined on a torus. 
So you can uh, sh sh show that the partition functions have a thermal distribution and so on and so forth. But not uh, in this case, when you're talking about asymmetrically flat space time, you expect a Euclidean CFT. That is too ultimate. OK? So yeah, so from Chandramoli's lecture, we know that uh, we can talk about asymptotically flat space times. in uh, bondy gauge and near null infinity okay so which i'll call scry plus future null infinity so close to that the matrix looks like this uh, i think you have already seen this form but let me just repeat because I want to uh, get to what super rotations actually are. So uh, this is just the flat metric, right? At uh, so at leading order because it's asymptotically flat space time, I should get back the flat metric. But then I can have some corrections to it, and. The corrections are of this form. Yeah. Here, for for now, there is no such assumption. So we don't know anything about the CFT. What is the central charge of it, and anything, nothing, right? And uh, yeah, I'll try to. Uh, derive what the central charge of the CFT is. But you will see that it's ambiguous. I, I'll, I'll make a comment about the central charge by the end of the day. Yeah. So something of this sort, right? So then uh, I have I have a flat space time uh, at null infinity, but then I can have subleading corrections to this space time, right? Then, and these subleading corrections, uh, remember? Oh, sorry. I love to. So in this gauge, uh, as as Chandramouli said, and I think emphasized a lot, that there are these conditions. That needs to be imposed even at subleading orders, right? That GRR is zero, GRA is zero, and uh, determinant of GAB is fixed. Okay, so these are the conditions, and you sort of expand these things. Now you see that these. Is there a question? In front of T, there, there, there is a R, so the limit R tends to infinity. Yeah, but you see, this is the two uh, the metric for the two sphere and the leading order term is uh, proportional to r square right so this is only i have a sort of nice question uh, i mean in pure gravity theory yes if i take this metric and plug it into anti yes on the right hand side am i supposed to get zero or one by r no you are supposed to get uh, some uh, leading uh, solution so you can solve it uh, solve it order by order exactly so what you will see is that if you take this answers and uh, for instance if you take it up to this point and put it in Einstein's equation, you will see that these uh, functions are related to each other. Okay, so I, I'll just write the expressions that you get. So these functions are not all independent; they're constrained by Einstein's equations. Okay. Ha uh -huh, please. You can you can you can have extensions to add derivative gravity. That is not a problem. Of course, uh, some things might change, but like the basic principles of it will not change. So, if you have higher derivative gravity, for instance, the equations of motion uh, will be different. Sir, like, uh, it, it like Gauss Bonnet theories, theories will have the same equation of motion, right? right? Yeah. So then it's it just goes through. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So the idea is that if I can show that these symmetries are related to some uh, physical quantities, right? Then I can sort of 
So this is my claim. My claim is that whatever dual theory that you have, okay, it has Virasoro symmetry in it, okay, and and it is defined on a 2D plane. So if it's defined on a 2D sphere and it has a Virasoro symmetry, then you can expect that it's a CFT, right? On, on the gravity side? And what are the yeah, so that is something that Partho will discuss, that how do you match the observables from the gravity side with the observables on the CFT so side. Which CFT is holography is an entirely different question, right? What I can tell you is some, pro some of the properties that this CFT must satisfy, OK? And, uh, and, and, and that is it. Like, uh, if, you want to give me, uh, give me, if you want me to give an example of a CFT, which might be holographic to 4D, uh, gravity, I don't have it. But what I can tell you is that these those CFTs, and this is I think what Partho will talk about. Where is Partho? Yeah. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. 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 So, for instance, he will discuss that there will be some operators, and the OPs of those operators will be fixed, and so on and so forth from the gravity side. Okay. Sorry, I was trying to answer some question. What was the Oh, you said, oh, okay, yeah, so I remember. So uh, you, you get the, when you expand, you get these fields, and these fields are in generically uh, functions of u, z, and z bar. And for instance, if you ap uh, apply Einstein's equations, so if you expand, for instance, g, u in leading order using the this ansatz, you will get a relation of this sort. This is the uh, leading order part of the stress tensor, a matter stress tensor, if you have it uh, along with your gravitational fields. So for instance, uh, these MBs will be related to O. Oh, I, I haven't defined what NZZs are. So N are what, is, what are known as bonding news, and they are just defined as del U of CABs. I think this is something even Chandramulli spoke about. And similarly, if you take GUZ component uh, up to leading order, And it will relate this NZ that you NZ field that you have. It's a long expression. What do you mean r comma 0? It's an r expansion. Right? Yeah, it's an r expansion. These are 1 over r. And the first one is also 1 over r. First one is also 1 over r, yes. It ent no, sorry, sorry. This one is, I think, 1 over r square. The matter enters at 1 over r square. So T u u m is defined as r square times uh, the total stress tensor as r goes to infinity. The total the u component of the total stress tensor should go as one over r square in order to have a finite energy, right? Because like the the sphere that you integrate over is going as r square, so if you want to have a finite energy, you should go as one over r square, and the leading order uh, term there will be picked up by this limit, and that is what enters here. Yes. So there is no contribution of this zero. What, what do you mean at zeroth order? Zero, first line the first line is just flat space time, right? Yes. And the flat space time is the solution of vacuum Einstein's equation. There is no matter, no nothing. Only this only enters at the subleading order. Yes.
plus sum okay so the only the, the thing that i was trying to uh, get to here is just that these uh, these data that i have written in b c z z and n z that comes there at the leading order uh, correction to the matrix to the flat matrix they are not all completely independent but uh, rather they are related by these sort of relations which comes from einstein's equation these are the constraints that come from einstein's equation as that answer your question devi good so you can clearly see that if you have this news then up to some u dependent coefficients all of these are uh, related to each other right so this news is you can sort of think of it as the radiative data then no this is th this is defined in two dimension like in the 2d matrix right yeah 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 because that's also traceless so uh, so two datas yeah thank you sorry what is the question you are taking back the yes where is g where is g i mean some oh hi i am setting i am setting those things to one i'm sorry yeah yeah any time you see don't see some constant that it should be there is so set to one yeah so you are you are expanding in one over in one over r right and you are matching this uh, coefficients at order by order so r will display. r will give you this order yes but until now the only place where g would have appeared would be in the coefficient of pu u m and pu exactly so those those are the matter part and that's where only where you will get the g is there are constraints con there are constraint part of einstein's equations right that are some of them are first order equations so there are some einstein's equation that gives dynamics and then there are some which just gives you some constraints these are the constraint equations that i have written i this this you get from you get einstein's equation yeah. there you have assumed some wild tensor vanishing conditions and so on so on. i don't exactly recall what uh, what are the exact uh, constraints that go up go in here but uh, yeah there might be some wild when going to zero sort of uh, limits there uh, and maybe i missed something but uh, you uh, sorry yeah normally had said determinant of gab by r squared of x uh, and you oh, is there any difference you yeah yeah i mean gamma you, you mean gamma ab right Yeah, so that uh, yeah, it's a different notation. It's a different notation, but it's the same thing, right? Yeah. Okay. So I just to answer the question about the uh, since you have the question about the wild tensor. Right? Yeah. So I think I think in this four dimension, the wild tensor uh, follows fix the boundary values of the shear, like fix the fix the values of C A B at psi plus plus and psi plus minus and various parameters. So by by now, I, I don't think in this expression that's being used. uh sorry i i don't i don't know maybe yeah, maybe so chandu that, that actually comes from the definition of asymptotic flat like there are these things called uh, i mean i think the way penrose defined it he defined it as um, like it, it basically comes from the fact that you know the the uh, ricci tensor alone does not determine the riemann tensor right in order to determine the riemann tensor you need both the ricci and the wild so for loss of both of them imply something for flat It, it falls off as I mean uh, it depends on which component of the wild tensor you look at. It falls off in a particular as as, as a particular power of R. Right. Like a particular component of the wild tensor falls off as a particular power of R. Like the full wild tensor will be zero, but the leading yeah. IC will be for the one over R will be non-zero. That's yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I can rub these right. Like this is not going to be important for. so now i want to find some the asymptotic symmetries which respect these uh, sort of uh, boundary matrix which gives me this sort of matrix at scribe plus 
So what I want is to find some vector fields xi such that lead derivative of g mu nu is uh, 0 up to some leading order in R. Okay? And these orders will uh, differ for different g mu, the mu nu components. So for instance, because my gauge condition says that this has to be 0 at or, or all order, what I would expect is that lead derivative of g r r is exactly 0 up to all orders in R. So is for g r a. And the determinant vanishing will sort of give me the condition that g a b g lead derivative of g a b is 0. Okay? So these are the, the conditions that need to be satisfied up to all orders in R. And if you just solve these equations, what you get is that the u component of this vector field is some function of u r and phi. That means the constraint that you had on it is sort of that del r of it should be 0. Similarly, the a component will have some function y, which is a function of u r and phi. Uh, it will be u theta phi, right? No. Sorry, thank you. Yeah. So okay, let me just use z because I was using z z bar components there for the sphere metric. Let me just write z z bar plus some i a, where i a will be some integration of r infinity to r. Okay. For the infinity. P and then del P of F. And the R component will be given by theta A minus U A del A and F. Okay? So these are the solutions that I get if I just solve these three equations. But of course, I have more constraints with me. So uh, all these, th these three equations are doing is basically fixing zeta r in terms of zeta a and zeta u. And in zeta u and zeta a, I have these uh, functions f and y. Okay? But I have more constraints. So for instance, I have g u r. And you see, up to 1 over r order, there is no g u r component. So what I expect is that if I have g u r, it should go as 1 over r square. Okay? This is a constraint that I can impose. And that gives, after solving it, that f dot, where dot is uh, the derivative with respect to u, is related to covariant derivative of y. Okay? So that is a condition that I get. And similarly, the UA component, the correction starts here, right, at order 1. So if I fix that, so if I say that UA component can have some order 1 correction, that will tell me that del U of YA is 0 which basically will tell me that ya are just functions of z and z bar okay and if you put this here you can in actually integrate this solution so this is one and if you put it plug it back here this will tell you that f is some u over 2 del a y a plus some function of z and z. Where? This? This u a? Oh, uh, sorry, I did not. So if you remember the, the way uh, Chandramoli actually expanded this metric, you had a u a there. Okay. Sorry, I did. 
So if you do solve this, what you see is that f can, uh, uh, can be expanded like this. And there is a, a function here, t, which is just a function of z and z bar. And there is a function y, which is also a fun function of z and z bar. Okay? And similarly, you have the condition that the uh, sphere metric can only be changed up to order r. And if you solve this constraint, what you get is that this y is the conformal killing vector for uh, the 2D metric. Okay? So, Yeah, uh, okay, then I have to rub this, I think. That's fine. Yeah, I, I, I might know the strategy, but I still not remember it, so. <laughs> That's fine. So this condition, if you write it in z, z bar coordinates, it will basically tell you that del z bar of y of z has to be 0. Okay. So this is the integration constant from, from this equation. right? This fixes the u derivative of f to be the derivative of y, covariant derivative of y. And then if you solve it, because y is now independent of u, you get t. This T is actually what is called the super translation generators. This is what Chandramuli was working on, which, which he wrote as small f. If you remember, his small f did not depend on u. That is because this part was absent. And this is the part that he was working with. OK. The last one, the fact that it has to be conformal killing vectors of the, of the 2D sphere. OK. Now, the point is that if you have this condition, what you do know is there are six, uh, I mean, similarly, you have a condition for y, z bar. So there are six functions that actually solve this condition globally, right? So y, z being, say, 1, z, or z square will solve this condition globally. That means it will be well defined everywhere for at, uh, in the full z plane. But what you can do, and this is what we also do in while discussing uh, conformal symmetries of 2D plane, is that you can say that, OK, I do not actually want a function that is uh, globally analytic. But rather, I'll settle for functions which are analytic at some in some region, locally uh, analytic. And then it can have poles outside, outside that region. OK? So what you can do is that you can say that any y of z which is a function of this sort, like z to the power n, will solve this equation. Yes? This is, I think, should be familiar with when we discuss like 2D CFTs and stuff. For all n. Could you remain the by the square again? Because only these are sort of globally defined, right? On a sphere. On a sphere. So what you want, so for globally defined, for instance, you can check that only these are the three functions that are defined at both z equals to 0 and z goes to infinity, right? which are sort of, in this coordinate, basically the north and south poles of the sphere. Okay? And if you go beyond it, or if you to consider, for instance, 1 over z or stuff like that, 1 over z is, is clear. It's clear to see that it's not defined at z equals to 0. 
And then if you take z cube, then you can do this sort of coordinate transformation, say w, which is say minus of 1 by z. Then w goes to 0, basically takes you to the other pole. right? And then you can check that uh, this, this will be ill-defined when you have z cube. Yes. If you invert it, you say that, I mean, if you write z as 1 over w and take w going to 0 limit, then you're saying it's not defined. So yes. this, I don't understand what you mean. What I mean is this. So Taking how do you take this limit, right? Yeah. This is clearly not, like, z equal to infinity is not part of. So see, first of all, you have to understand that if you consider this z coordinate and z equals to 0 to be your north pole, then your coordinate is not very well defined at the south pole. Okay? So in order to have a well defined coordinate at south pole, what you do is this coordinate transformation. You go to z, you do this sort of transformation. Okay? And the point is now your vector field. What is your vector field? Your vector field is some yz del z. Right? And you want to you want to write this in this w coordinates. So what you do is that you will write it as yz del w del z del w. Does that make sense? Okay. And what is this? Del W del Z is just minus one over Z, uh, one over Z square, right? Or you can write it as W square, whatever. It is. And Y Z. Then if you take Z square, which is one over W square, you see that this is well defined. Okay. So at at W goes to zero. But if you take Z cube. It will give you 1 over w, del w, which is not defined at all. Okay, so this is, uh, you're trying to take now y going to infinity. Yes. And then you substitute it by exactly. and then i here. Okay. So, so these are the only possible options that are defined both at z goes to 0 and z goes to, w, uh, z goes to infinity. Okay, okay. okay. But what I'm saying is that if you do not uh, put this condition on your vector fields, if you say that, okay, I, I can have meromorphic functions instead of just analytic functions. Then you can take any power of z, and that will solve these equations for you. OK? And these are the super rotation. Huh. Uh -huh. Yes. In uh, you mean in ADS three sort of yeah, cases? Yeah. So okay. Okay, I I have to think. Like, can we just discuss it after some time? Because, yeah, I am not exactly sure. Like, what are you talking about? Okay. Okay, so these are what are known as my super rotation generators. Now the point is that, OK, I can sort of mathematically see that I, I had some solutions which are globally well-defined. And now I had some mathematical solutions that solves it, which are locally uh, well-defined, analytic, but they're not globally analytic. But do they actually correspond to some physical symmetry is, is a question that you can ask. right? And uh, what I try to show, hopefully, in this lecture is that they actually do correspond to some physical symmetries. Okay. Good. And so, OK. So you can ask, uh, I, I think this is also something that uh, Chandramoli talked about in his lectures, that these are basically how the uh, metric gets transformed. So these are the vector fields. But if you want to ask that how the data, the radiative data that you had in your metric, how do they actually transform under super rotation? So let me just give you. An example. So, for instance, CZZ, how does it transform under this super rotation? And then, okay. this is given by
it transforms something like this. And the way uh, the. Oh, OK, OK. So all of this, the expansion that I did, which I just rubbed off, I think, because I did not follow the 1, 3, 2 rule that I was talking about. So uh, all of these things I was doing near scry plus, okay. right? Okay. So you can do all these things sim uh, similarly on scry minus. And this plus is just supposed to indicate that I'm near the future null infinity and not past null infinity. OK? Just one. Huh, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, like capital I, right? uh, so that, oh. Here, there, there are two, three functions I can see. F. No, this I A is sort of fixed by F, right? Oh, okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh huh. These these three along with y z bar uh, being 1 z bar and z bar square, those six will give you rotations and boosts. So rotations and boosts are the globally defined SL2C tra transformations. And all these, uh, all the other stuff that are not globally defined are not actually isometries of flat space, right? So what they are, I'll talk about uh, hopefully later. But uh, th the globally defined generators are actually what gives you lo rotation and boost. Yeah, thanks for that question. OK. So the, 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 which terms are uh, going to be 0 if I reduce to d1, z, z Like this d3 d is uh, probably going to go to 0. Yeah, so this hom inhomogeneous part goes to 0. The rest of it stays. Everything else. Yeah, everything else stays. Of course, if you take one, uh, some of these things will vanish and stuff like that. But the point is that this is exactly what I was trying to point out, that there is a part which is homogeneous on CZZ, right? which is this part. And there is a part which is inhomogeneous in CZZ, because this, this, this is not. And what you will see is that this homogene inhomogeneous part is actually what uh, generates uh, what are known as the soft charges. Okay? So this will be related to the soft charge. No, that's why it's inhomogeneous, right? It's not proportional to C. The rest of it is proportional to C. Not linearly proportional. No, there is no C here. It's inhomogeneous. That's why it's uh, see if if it was if it was a C, then I can take the whole differential operator out, and I can just say that delta of C is some operator times C. Yes. So the point is that if you if you started with a metric that did not have this CZZ, okay, and you do this transformation, you can still generate some CZZ through this term, okay. So that is the idea. Yeah. Right. So if I allow for um, uh, singular vector fields like this, right, the end, right. The it will change, but you can show that it doesn't still get any order R corrections. You can show that it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Order so one, order one. I mean. Order one, yeah, sorry. Yeah, it doesn't get any order one corrections. It, it can get one of our R corrections, yes, but not order one. So yeah, because you see, I solved this iteratively, right? I made sure that every constant is satisfied throughout this process. Right, I'm just thinking that if you have, um, if, you, if you take f is uh, u by 2, uh, let's, call, let's say u alpha. Yeah. Yes. There should be something that there will be a do u of uh, uh, this. So be because of this, you're saying? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, OK, let me. Uh -huh. So this uh, Yes. Yes, yes. So yes, this is precisely like the anomalous term in the stress tensor. I agree. So this looks like something that will give you a central charge, right? The, the Z Q. Yeah, so sorry, Anish, you were saying something? Ah, so if, if you take like L psi of D U U. Yes. Um, uh, then you'll have like a, uh, a term that will go like G U alpha do U psi alpha, right? G U alpha. 
Yes. Alpha box. Ah, right. So now if uh, for uh, uh, ZiU, mm -hmm. I have a U dependent piece. For ZiU, yes. Yes, if alpha is U, I have a, a, a U dependent piece. Right. And there is order one, right? There is no R. There is no R. That's right. This piece you are talking about, yes, right? Yes. yes. Uh, I think for one Z and Z bar, that term will not be. I, I think so, but yeah. For but for higher order terms, it will contribute, right? Yes. I think it still does maintain, but like I have to think like how exactly this thing is working out. But yeah, ultimately the asymptotic symmetry part is is still maintained. Yeah, the qu question is whether it change whether this field if you if you don't restrict it to so the point is if this part is non-zero, okay, and this is non-zero for uh, for example this z to the power n for a generic n, the question is does that change the leading order piece of GUU? Which should be fixed to minus one. That is the question, right? Like if, for example, if you have the diffie morphism, the generalized BMS, it right. certainly changes yeah, that. So uh, here also, I think it changes at some, in principle changes, but I think it changes at isolated points or something like that. I think, I'm not sure, but naively this expression should be there, right? This should be a term in the least yeah, But, but this, uh, you've got the other two terms also. Yeah, yeah, correct, but they will, when, let's say if you add the other two, uh, so you will have. Um, the xi alpha, do alpha, gu u, that way that is anyway 0. And right. then you have a gu uh, a, do u xi a. And the xi a does not have u de dependent at order, uh, order uh, uh, 1, right? No, xi it doesn't. Xi a doesn't have, because y a is independent of z, and that's ah. i a component. So at order 1, it none of No, it has, it has, it has. See? Del b of f comes here. And, uh, yeah, and then f, this f will have some u dependent terms, and that might cancel cancel these terms. Okay. okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, so one, three, two, right? <laughs> oh, that's three. Good, good. Okay, so then what we see is that we have this uh, symmetry near scry plus. Okay, so the symmetry near scry plus is this uh, is generated by this T's, which are the super translations, and these Y's, which are the super rotations. Okay, and I'll write plus to indicate that they are near scry plus. This is the super translation, and this corresponds to super rotations. The point is, you can do all the analysis that you did near scry minus, right? Near the past null infinity, and near scry minus, you will get same sort of an analysis. Everything else will go through. You just replace u with v and define these new generators and so on and so forth. And you will get some t minus, which is, I mean, some algebra spanned by, uh, some vector fields which are spanned by these two functions. And they'll, st uh, they'll also give you some symmetry, OK? So the total symmetry, uh, asymptotic symmetry of the full space time that you found is this sort of, if you call it, call this BMS plus and this BMS minus, then the total symmetry group is just BMS plus cross BMS minus, right? The question is, like I was asking, that whether this is a physical symmetry of your theory, OK? And the answer is obviously not. The reason is because both BMS plus and BMS minus contains uh, Lorentz transformations, right? Which were generated in this case by the global modes of this Y plus 
and in this case the global modes of y minus now suppose you are near so this is the penrose diagram of my uh, asymptotically flat space time this is my spatial infinities my time like infinities and these are my sky pluses and sky minuses okay now suppose i had some scattering process some say 2 to 2 scattering process so i had some scattering process here say at v equal to 0 and two particles from north pole and south pole came they interacted did something and then they ended up at say u equal to 0 again at north pole and south pole so this is a scattering process like i can calculate the scattering amplitude of this and so on so forth and what this is saying is that there is a symmetry which is bms plus cross bms minus which acts this bms plus acts on this cry plus and the bms minus acts here on sky minus but if the total symmetry group is actually the physical symmetry of the system then what i can do is that i can take the take some lorentz transformation of this bms minus and rotate these two points of the scattering amplitude arbitrarily right and then if I claim that that is the symmetry, then that should tell you that this scattering amplitude should be related to that scattering amplitude through this symmetry transformation, right? That should not be that should not be happening. If I have any that, that would mean that in, if I have any two to two scattering, all of these will be related by some symmetry transformation, right? That should not be the case. So, because in in general, of course, if you have a scattering amplitude and you boost the full scattering amplitude, those two uh, scattering amplitudes should be related to each other by some symmetry. That's trivial. That's a trivial statement. But here it's saying that any 2 to 2 scattering amplitude should be related by symmetry transformation. That should not be the case. So the way to go around this problem, Strominger proposed a diagonal subgroup. of this total symmetry group and this he calls BMS 0 and the way you define BMS 0 is you say that right 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 No, these are these are asymptotic states, right? So these are at infinity. Okay. So two particles are coming from infinity. They are scattering and they are going back to infinity. Okay. So this is a generic two to two scattering. It's just I fixed north and south pole so that like it, my life becomes easier. Okay. The question is that if I say that this is the tot this BMS plus cross BMS minus is a symmetry of my physical theory, yes. that means it should be a symmetry of my scattering amplitudes. Yes. And so this BMS plus acts only on uh, future null infinity, okay. right? And this BMS minus acts on past null infinity, Fine. right? So that tells me that what I can do is that I can take some, say, say, I can just rotate these two points using some global generators from this set. Rotate in what sense? Within, in, in, in this sphere, okay. right? Because the global generators of, of Y plus basically gen uh, generate some rotation. Or, or say I can boost these two, okay. but I will still keep these two fixed, right? The point is that I can arbitrarily change these two points and these two points, and if this is the symmetry of the system, then this scattering amplitude should be related to that scattering amplitude, right. and that should not be the case, right? Any two to two scattering amplitude should not be related to each other so by symmetry you transformation. Can, you can construct any, any, scattering any scattering amplitude given one scattering amplitude, right? And that should not be the case. Mm -hmm. This is using the, the argument for this argument this is sufficient to just use the global part. That's what we already knew, right? There is no two copy of Lorentz. Exactly. So that is a, if there is no two copy of Lorentz, then there definitely cannot be two copies of you are saying now you take a diagonal for everything, not just global path. Yes. Yes. So at least the diagonal subgroup solves the problem for the global part, right? You are saying that I'll only for the global part I'll identify these two and then. 
Yeah, it, it, it because then the like how do you relate these radiative data that scry plus and scry minus will be problematic. So I'll not only just maybe that statement doesn't make sense. Yeah, exactly. It probably doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. So what Strominger proposed is that you use instead of this full uh, BMS plus cross BMS minus group, you use this diagonal part of BMS. And what what he, what he basically means by this diagonal part is that you sort of identify these generators at antipodal points. Okay, so T plus at ZZ bar, where this ZZ bar is at scry plus, is identified with T minus at ZZ bar. Okay, where this ZZ bar is at scry minus. Okay, so the idea is that if you sort of consider a null line, so maybe that's, this is a bad way. Sorry? No, so yeah, so the way I'm defining uh, my Z and Z bar coordinates here, and uh, I mean at scry minus and scry plus, is that if you have, for instance, a null line which starts from the North Pole and just goes to scry plus, then wherever it ends up at is my North Pole at scry plus. Okay? So that is why I sort of changed the NNS here. Okay? Does that make sense? So I'll have a null line that will start from here, say from North Pole, and then Wherever it ends up at, that's my North Pole for uh, Scry Plus. If you're North Pole or South Pole, is it Yeah, yeah. So, so that is why I've written Z and Z bar. So if you if you want to say it's South Pole, you can just just change this condition to Z bar and Z. That Z goes to Z bar and Z bar goes to Z. No, but uh, the antipolar identification that Strominger did, it says that if you go from North, you would uh, come out of South, right? That's yeah, but the point, I mean, it. What he basically says is that you have to relate because you have to sort of take this full group and boil it down to some diagonal subgroup. So you have to relate some Z, Z bar data to some data there, right? And what I'm saying is that it depends on how you define Z and Z bar coordinate as scry plus and scry minus. So the way I sort of, I guess I wrote it in my notes, is that you define it to be the North Pole of the, uh, sphere, the outgoing sphere. Okay, so any particle that comes out of, comes from the North Pole of the incoming sphere, it ends up, and wherever it ends up at, you call it the North Pole, and then you sort of identify these two points. Okay, you can you can equally do it. The, the point that I, even he was making that you can equally say that it's it ends up at South Pole, which will just change this condition to something like this. Okay, that wh whatever the Z value here was is the Z bar value here. And whatever the z bar value here was the z value here, and you can still do the same thing. It's, it will still be an antipodal matching condition, right? It will still take this group and boil it down to some diagonal subgroup. Okay. But for now, I'm sort of sticking with it. And uh, yeah, and this clearly uh, takes care of the fact that now all my global generators are sort of act. So if I, for instance, rotate what this uh, this effectively does, and also also for y plus, what this effectively does is it says that if I do some transformation here at scry minus, I have to do a similar transformation here at scry plus, and then those two scattering amplitudes will be related to each other through this symmetry. Okay. So if I, for instance, boost these two states. Then I'll also need to boost these two states, and that sort of makes sense. But even then, it's a non-trivial statement because because I because of these t pluses. Now t pluses, if you okay, you see it's not working. This one three two thing, okay. So anyway, so these t pluses were uh, part of this uh, xi use, right? So what that means is that suppose. And those are angle dependent translations, right? Because I can change the u part of uh, a part of this scattering at some point and may not I may not change it at South Pole. So what I'm trying to say is that suppose you take the same scattering process. This is the two uh, incoming particles were coming at v equal to zero. One was at North Pole, one was at South Pole. Using this t plus, what I can do is that I can only shift this particle from uh, v equal to zero to some v equal to something else, right? 
So what I can do is do something like this. That suppose my one of the particles there is still at south pole at v equal to 0. But now I have shifted this one using these t generators to say some v equal to v prime. And this is the north pole of the v equal to v prime. Okay? What this diagonal uh, matching condition tells me that I have to do the same thing here as well. But that will mean that the south, the particle that was ending up at south pole will still stay at u equal to 0. But this one will get shifted to some u equal to, yeah, v prime is not probably a good idea, say v equal to some a. So then this will change to some u equal to a. Okay? So this particle will still stay at the south pole of u equal to 0. But this one will now go to the north pole of u equal to a. And this scattering okay, from here to sort of here will actually be related to this scattering through this super translation. Right? So super translation will relate this sort of a scattering amplitude to this sort of a scattering amplitude. So I have done some uh, corresponding uh, transformation here, uh, both at no, both at this scry minus and scry plus. But because the transformations are angle dependent, I can sort of tweak and turn these two uh, particles, and these two should be related by super translation. Related, right? they, should be the same they should be the same amplitude. Yeah, because this is the symmetry of my theory. Yes. Is it about yeah. The point is that. Yes, for now I am demanding it to be the symmetry, but the, uh, because I can show that this symmetry actually is nothing but uh, soft theorem, Weinberg's soft theorems, so that will just tell me that this actually is the symmetry. Sorry. No, no, no. This, this identification just tells me that it has to be u equal to a. Okay? Because whatever I do at scry minus, I have to do the same thing at scry plus. Right? Only then are these, these, these two things related. Does that make sense? And I can do the sim I can do something similar for super rotations as well. I'm just the. What happens to other uh, outside this uh, diagonals? Are those? What happens to? Those are not those are not physical symmetries of my theory. Uh, they are still the like if you do if you transform your space time with those generators, you will still get an asymptotically flat space time. Mm -hmm. It's just that I will not say that those uh, those uh, those preserve my scattering amplitude. Those will not be the symmetries of my gravitational scattering amplitude. Those will not correspond to any physical symmetries. Okay? There, will there be any symmetry outside this group? Because you have already you are fixing both of the generators at, at DMS plus and DMS minus, right? So yeah. what is left? Uh, like you are fixing both of it, right? So what is left outside of this? No. So for instance, I can, I can take some element of BMS minus given by this T minus and then some element of BMS plus which is not equal to this T minus, right? the total symmetry of my space time is given by these four functions okay, okay, okay. No, I right I yeah i am imposing this condition and i am saying that only this this uh, subgroup of this total group corresponds to some physical uh, symmetry but there are generators outside of it which does not correspond to some physical symmetry. okay okay Yes. So you are having like two copies of the symmetry. But so here the, I, I have reset the base space of gravity, right? I can just work with the fields only on uh, scry minus, or I can just work with only the on scry plus. plus. So I have a BMS. Now, if I but if I, that's for like any initial value problem, that's all I need. But if I want to do scattering, I want to relate something here to something there. So I it's not like I have the full symmetry of the product of the two. There should be some way this this symmetry is related to that. 
and the most natural canonical identification is, is this by diagonal uh, yeah. right I am not following the order. Okay, I'll. Should I take the second one now? Let's see what it does. Just tell me what to do. Okay. <laughs> okay. So now, okay. Yeah, 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 it's uh, it's his fault, not mine. No, I, I think you should also take that board out so that people can see what just happened. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is what I originally did. <laughs> so now what I uh, want to show. It does, is that the symmetries that I'm talking about, both these super translations and super rotations. I'll mostly focus on super rotations, so not super translations, but uh, they do correspond to some uh, physical phenomena. Okay, and the physical statement that I want to relate it with are nothing but the soft theorems. Okay, so these are now fairly well-known theorems. Uh, for gauge theories and both both for gauge theories and gravity theories, and what this theorem says is that suppose you have some n particle scattering amplitude. I'll draw the okay. Suppose there are some n particles, say p one, p two, p three, up to p n, and with this scattering amplitude, I, uh, with this scattering amplitude, I, I add some uh, photon or graviton, some some gauge boson. Then I will get a n plus one scattering, n plus one point scattering amplitude, right? And that n plus one scattering uh, point scattering amplitude will be related to this, if I consider the uh, the frequency of the boson to be close to zero. So if I have if I attach a gauge boson to this scattering amplitude. In general, it will it will be part of the scattering amplitude. Okay, where epsilon is the polarization. The point is that this scattering amplitude will be related to this scattering amplitude at the leading order in omega. Okay, so at leading order in omega, these uh, the leading order in omega is given by some one over omega term, and what I'll get is that. Uh, this scattering amplitude will be one over omega times some universal factor times the endpoint scattering amplitude. Okay. Even for gravity, you can show further that if you have some omega to the power zero term, and this is true even for QED, I'll get even at omega omega to the power zero term, I'll get this uh, some universal factor times the endpoint scattering amplitude. Okay. So that is the statement of my. It's easy to prove at tree level. At uh, I think for this one one over omega term, you can prove it at for loop level. I don't know if it, if you can prove this for loop level as well. This is this is a statement that should hold for the full scattering amplitude. Okay. No, not in, in not in four dimension. So these are the works that the Sane and others did. That in four dimension, this sort of uh, a series doesn't work because there are some log omega terms that appear yeah, in, so in this sort of expansion. Like, uh, so in tree levels, uh, but those don't appear at tree level, I agree. So at tree level, this is true. At higher dimensions, this is, I think, true for both tree level and loop level amplitudes. This part is definitely true. The first part, the fact that it's go, the leading order pole is at one is it goes as one over omega and it's proportional to this is true at both tree loop level at all dimensions. But uh, yeah, 
this expansion is true only for three level scattering amplitudes. Sorry? There are some heuristic arguments as to think why log terms come because, but since it's not coming here, I'm not going to talk about it. Okay, uh, the point is that uh, if I tell you where the log term is coming from, you will ask me what does it, which symmetry does it correspond to? I don't have a good answer to that. The point is that, at, sorry, at uh, four dimensions, uh, what you can show is that these uh, momentum eigenstates that we talk about, okay, they don't actually become free even when they go to asymptotic infinities. Okay, so there are yeah, some long range interactions that are only present in four dimensions. And because of that, you will get some log pieces. Yeah, maybe you can ask Sitan that he, he knows all this stuff. <laughs> oh, okay. Then imagine my problem. I didn't even know. <laughs> okay. And uh, the point is that uh, what do these S0s and S1s look like? So this S0 looks like sum over n epsilon dot pn, where epsilon is the, so if it's a graviton, it will have some polarization vector, say epsilon mu nu, and I'm talking about gravitons, okay? So this will look like epsilon mu nu, let me make sure that I am correct. New over Q dot P, where Q is the Q is the momentum of this soft graviton. So Q mu will be given by omega with one over Q hat. Okay, so this will be just the direction and the energy of the soft graviton is just omega. Okay. This and there will be some factors of kappa, like some G Newton factors here, which I'm not writing. And the S1 will be related to some angular momentum thingies. So it'll be like Epsilon mu nu p k. So this is okay. So this is sum over n. So similarly here, p n mu q lambda j lambda mu or something like that. over p dot q. Okay. So uh, the first soft factor has these uh, powers of p above the momentum and the second one has this angular momentum in the numerator. The denominator in the first case goes as one over Q, which basically means it goes as one over omega. And here there's a Q above and below, so it, it is omega to the power zero. Sorry, what is the N? This N? This N. Ha, that is just the label. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. So what I want to show is that these, uh, these symmetries that I'm talking about are nothing but these soft theorems in disguise, okay? So super translation symmetry, for instance, corresponds to this leading soft theorem and super rotation symmetries correspond to this subleading soft theorem. I'll make sure, I, I'll mean precisely what I mean by this <coughs> corresponds to statement. So. So first, let me let me discuss what do I mean by symmetries of S matrix, okay? And those will give me my word identities. Okay. 
okay so uh, as chandramouli did in the first lecture uh, corresponding to these uh, asymptotic symmetries that you have you can construct charges right because you can define a symplectic form and from there you can construct conserved charges and what you would expect is that if these symmetries are actually the symmetries of your s matrix then these charges should commute with your s matrix okay so that is the statement that if i if i say that these are symmetries of my s matrix what i would expect is that this should be zero okay where qs are the charges corresponding to the symmetries that i just wrote okay and the point is that if i break down my charges into some hard parts and some soft parts okay so first of all let me just expand this equation and see what you get so this basically tells me that there is a qs minus some sq and that will give me zero when these q charges act on in states right these are these in states are defined near sky minus right so they these q will be defined with respect to the generators that i had near sky minus and similarly when this q acts on out state then this uh, will be defined with respect to the generators of the out state uh, at near sky plus right so just to the, uh, just for that i'll just write q pluses and q minuses so that we remember that when we act it on in state will we are having these uh, generators corresponding close to sky minus when we act it on out states we act it with generators close to sky minus good hmm. yes you can do that but that is what you are going to do right so for now <laughs> sorry no but this is the statement for a generic s matrix in any dimension right what you have is for a s uh, for any scattering process you have some in states you have some out states and the s matrix basically says that uh, s matrix basically says that what in state goes to what out state with what probability and so on so on, right and the statement that you have a symmetry of s matrix basically says that if you consider this commutator then this commutator should vanish yes you so you are saying that you can just talk about bms so you are you, what you are basically saying is that i'll define all my states as some so within i'll consider just some s2 and then there i'll define some insertions that will tell me what are my in states and what are my out states that is true you can do that so one of the things that even here you can do that because i am just talking about massless particles right so massless particles so suppose i have some in state and this in state is suppose n uh, massless particles so i can just label this in state by the points at which these particles are inserted okay so i'll just label it by z1 up to zn where these are the points where these particles are inserted and the point is that the momentum of these particles up to some energy say suppose if you are talking about the kth particle then up to some energy these momentums are fixed by these uh, zz bar coordinates right so i can use some parameterization say these particles end up at zk and zk bar so something like this right so that is just the statement that you can have these in states and out states defined on the sphere because the moment you fix zs and z bars for each of these particles you have basically fixed where do they end up at in sky minus and sky plus okay but for now i am not at least talking about this i will use it some at some point while proving this identities but i have this right and then i can write these uh, say for instance q minus as the hard part 
plus soft word. Okay. And what does the hard part do? So, okay. So, if I have these in states as momentum eigenstates, then what I can do is that I can, uh, okay, let me just tell. So, like I said, this in states, will, uh, there are suppose n particle states going, giving from z1 up to some zn. Then what this hard part of the charge should do is that it should just take these z1s and zn's and should transform them according to the like the vector fields that it was doing, right? So what this hard hard charges will do is that it will just induce these transformations on the hard particles from up to z1 to zn. And I have uh, like erased all of it, but you can just okay, let me just write the form for it. The action of this hard part on this state is just nothing but this. Does that make sense? Because what I just did is that I took the hard part of my charges and instead of uh, instead of writing it in space-time coordinates, what I did is that I just took a Fourier transform of it. And that is, uh, so I had, for instance, if you remember, I had V D V sort of terms and or U D U, and that sort of gives me a E K del E K sort of terms here. Okay. So this is the action of my hard charges on these states. This is true for scalar particles. So if you want uh, any kind of, so if you have spinning particles, for instance, then, then you will replace this by some Lie derivative of y minus, for example. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that question. Okay. So this is the action of the hard part, and what so the soft part did, if you remember, that there was an inhomogeneous piece of. Uh, 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 while I, I was talking about the transformation of these radiative data, there was an inhomogeneous piece, and the soft part should basically uh, give rise to that inhomogeneous piece, right? So, if you remember the inhomo inhomogeneous transformation I had for uh, CZZ or even the new tensor, if you want to write NZZ, say, the inhomogeneous transformation was given by some del Z cube times Y of minus Z, right? There was an inhomogeneous piece of this sort. And what I claimed was that my soft charge should actually induce this inhomogeneous transformation. Right? So whatever my, so if my soft part induces this transformation, then I can write that whatever my soft part is, that commuter the commutator of that with NZZ should be this. Yes. Right. So yeah. So. Yes. But now this inhomogeneous piece comes with a U dependent. That's right. So you cannot throw away the piece, but you, what you can do is that up to linear order you can define, you can still define these charges. And when I'm talking about these charges, I'm talking about the charges up to linear order. Okay. But you are right that uh, when when you. So, so as he was saying that uh, if you, uh, while we are defining the variation of these charges, right? So there was some inhomogeneous piece, and it was giving rise to some. Uh, so you couldn't you couldn't take the variation out of the full integral and just have to define. And there you could you could do it because you could put some boundary conditions and so on and so forth in U, which would uh, uh, give yeah. cancel these uh, extra pieces, right? But here, because in CZZ, I'm writing here the variation of the NZZ, which is del U of CZZ. But in the variation of CZZ, there was a U dependent piece, right? So that that stops you from doing that U integral that you had in uh, in the definition of the charge. Okay. 
but you can what you can do is that you can expand it in linear order so up to linear order you can still do that integral okay uh -huh. yes what do you mean harden Right. So what, meant, what you meant by hard and soft was yes. the, the, the energy essentially of the external particle. That's right. So that means the data of what is hard and what is soft yes. is, in the, is in the in is in the state. state. Right. Yes. So now uh, doesn't this? Uh, yeah, yeah. So this is sort of ad hoc. So what I'll prove is that this uh, once I write this QS minus, what I'll prove is that this QS minus corresponds to some omega goes to zero limit of of some state. Okay, so this QS minus what this QS minus will actually do is that it will generate a, a graviton of zero frequency. Okay, so you see what I'm doing. I'm uh, what I want to find is some total Q, the, the total charge, because I want to find a physical symmetry of the system, and the physical symmetry of the system is such that that whatever charge I construct, it should commute with the S matrix, right? And I want to understand what is the effect of this charge in uh, the states, the in and out states, mm -hmm. right? What the, the way I'm defining these hard and soft charges are as follows. What I'll show, and this part is obviously clear, that what this hard part does is that it takes the state that I have, which is the in particle state, and it sort of transforms that state, right, through these generators, yeah. right? What this soft part does at least for now, it just it looks like that whatever whatever this soft part is doing is that it's just generating this sort of a transformation, yeah. right? But when I go to this Fox space language, what I finally want to show is that what this soft part is doing is that it's creating an additional uh, graviton of zero frequency with these end states. Okay, so so if you do this sort of separation here. Okay, if you just write Q plus as QH plus QS minus and this as Q minus and QS minus, what this will look like is this. So suppose instead of Q plus, I substitute QH plus plus QS minus S minus S times QH minus. This is the statement, right? And then suppose I put all these QHs in one side and QS on the other. So I get some statement of this sort. S minus S. Sorry? Huh. Yes. This will be equal to this right and what this qh plus and qh minus does is that it generates this sort of a transformation right so and of course uh, these whatever y's and y minuses i'll have uh, for qh minus i'll have these y minus generators for qh plus i'll have the y plus generators but because I'm talking about the diagonal subgroup, those two will be same, right? So what I can do is that I can finally, I can write this whole thing uh, together. So I'll have this sort of derivative of y, say y, just set k minus half dz of y minus z, ek del ek sum over k and I can take this out, right? I can just write this over term for this side. Okay, so whenever the, uh, for example, energy is going to zero, that means, let's say some particle of zero energy. Yes. No, this, this E is the energy of these Z1 to Zm, this finite energy particles. Okay. Okay. okay? So this is just the uh, left-hand side of this equation. 
the right hand side of this equation you still don't know what it does okay so what i'll argue is that this qs minus operator acting on the in state gives you a n plus 1 particle state where the n plus 1th particle is basically a soft graviton okay and similarly here so what i'll write it for as a notation is that i'll write it as some qss normal order qss this is my definition of the normal order qss and what i try to prove is that this is nothing but uh, what this does is just it just creates a soft graviton okay, okay? so when you say inner nodes these are just hard these are just hard particles yes yeah, yeah. thanks thank you Exactly. Yeah. So write down the Poisson brackets and make it so Dirac and so on and so forth. Right. Right. And similarly, you can write down the states in terms of creation of eta. <coughs> right. And then, then all of these formulas are again systematically followed. That's right. Exactly. Oh, sorry. I. So. From this commutation relation, actually, you can write what is the form of QS minus. Because uh, if you remember last time, uh, Chandramoli derived what is the Poisson bracket between M, this Ns are. So this, for instance, Nz bar Z bar at some V Z Z bar with Z Z at some P prime. W W prime is given by this sort of a relation, right? Omega Z Z bar delta two sub V del V of delta of P minus V prime. Right? So you know that this uh, these news sort of follows this sort of a Poisson bracket uh, or commutator. And from this commutator, you can guess what the form of QS minus should be. Because QS minus with the news gives you this sort of a term. So that you can convince yourself that up to some total derivatives, QS minus is given by this. And I'm writing V instead of U because I'm uh, close to scry minus. Oh, I, I'm just defining this to be my normal ordering, uh, normal ordered QSS. That's it, Not, nothing else. So this state, uh, you are clear, right? It just came from this, just dividing the charge into soft part and hard part. And whatever this QS plus S minus S QS minus is, I'm calling it normal ordered QSS. That's my definition of the normal ordered operator QSS. Okay, sorry. Yes, in some sense, yes. But I haven't yet spoken about anything about the CFT2 or anything. OK? For now, I'm just talking about the 4D scattering amplitude. Okay. Sorry, you had a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, OK. I'll, I'll wrap it. Yeah. OK? Great. So this is my definition of QS minus. And and as John Romoli was saying that if you sort of uh, do, if you just uh, quantize everything and write it as a sort of modes of uh, creation and annihilation operator, what you will see is that this QS minus basically corresponds to some omega goes to zero limit of these <coughs> soft gravity. This is true for both super translation and super rotation. So if you remember, for super translation, uh, the soft part that he defined did not have a sort of V sitting here, right? It was just something linear to linear with NZZ. Okay, if you, if you can just go back to the notes. And that is because that will correspond to the one over omega pole. So this, that will actually correspond to the one over omega, the leading term in the soft graviton theorem. And because of this V, what you can sh show is that the soft graviton that I'll find doing this mode expansions, it will uh, basically project out that that pole, that one over omega pole, and it'll actually give me this omega to the power zero. Two. Yeah, 
here in this sort of theorem. Uh, I, I don't know. There was a, a great discussion between Sane and Shiraz at some NSM, I remember. And the way Shiraz was trying to think about this was that at leading order, if you have a graviton, it actually only sees the mass of the particle. You can think of it like this, right? So at, at leading order, that means if the graviton, so, so how does gravity actually see a scattering process? So this is a scattering process, right? This is an n-particle scattering process. And you are sort of inserting a graviton. So what you can think of it is that at, at the very leading order, all gravity cares about is just the mass of the particle, mass of these particles that are there in the system. And at subleading order, it cares about the angular momentum of the particle. So it's sort of like a, I don't want to say this, but it's sort of like a multipole expansion in that sense, right? Yeah, but that's a very heuristic argument. What you can just, uh, what you can just do is, it, the much better thing to do is just to take an endpoint amplitude and try to attach a graviton to it and see what it does, right? So suppose you have some endpoint amplitude. If you want to make an n plus one point amplitude with a graviton, where, what, where can you attach that graviton? That graviton can at, uh, either attach to some external line or it can attach to some internal propagator, right? And that is how you can generate all sort of uh, tree level, at, at least at tree level, you can generate all sort of Feynman diagrams from. The point, point is, suppose it attaches to some external line there, okay? So you had this amplitude and you attach a graviton to some or for, if you want to make matters simpler, just consider some photon, okay? And attach it somewhere here, because for photon we know what these things actually look like much more. So suppose this is the external line with some momentum pk, okay, right? And you are attaching a graviton here, or photon, say photon, okay? Some epsilon mu and q mu. You're attaching it here. The point is, what is this new amplitude going to look like? So this new amplitude is going to have the full endpoint amplitude multiplied with this vertex factor and this extra propagator, right? Because at first this was an external propagator, so it was not contributing to the diagram, but now this has become an internal propagator and it does contribute to the diagram, right? So what you have, this, what this picture is equal to is some vertex factor, which would be some epsilon dot p, right? with this propagator, which will be, if this is the Q, this is P, so this will be P plus Q squared minus M squared, right? Now just expand this. So this vertex factor is there. This is PK squared plus Q squared plus two PK dot Q minus M squared. This is a photon. So Q square is zero. If you're going on shell, PK square is M square, right? So this cancels. So what you have is two PK dot Q. That is exactly that term, right? So at leading order, when Q goes to zero, not Q, omega, the omega goes to zero limit, you see that there, there is a one over omega pole, okay? So that's, I think, the most clean way to see that there should be a pole of this sort. And you can do the same thing for omega to the zero order. You can find all the Feynman diagrams and where would this omega to the zero contributions will come from. And you will see that it basically gives you this angular momentum term. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there are some uh, as this shift symmetry and some generalizations of. Yes, I think the the name of the paper is does scalars have asymptotic symmetries? I have, yeah. Huh? Ha uh ha. -huh. So yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, uh, I'll take ten minutes and then probably we can just go through that proof. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So 
if I have these things, as I was talking about, that you can do this uh, some sort of uh, mode expansions. And what you can do is that you can take, uh, for instance, your gravitational perturbation field, uh, the perturbative part of the metric, and you can sort of made mode expand it, right? Like you usually do. And that will be some uh, integration d3p over q p and c to the power i q dot x p dot x minus with a. Huh. There will be some epsilon factors. And uh, with this will come some a minuses, and then some pluses. Okay. So this is the mode expansion of the metric perturbation. What you can do is that you can similarly. Uh, so what are your czzs if you remember? Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, wait a minute. Okay. And then what you can have is that you can have, for instance, CZZ, which you'll define. If you remember, this, this was just the HZZ, but the one of our, the, one, the part of HZZ that was proportional to R. So, I'll define it like this. It will be. 1 over r of h z z okay did i write it correctly this a is yeah don't worry about this yeah sorry let me write the full thing so h menu so this will be mu nu some alpha with some a alpha, thank you dot x, and then some a dagger alpha, okay, the minus. Great. So this is just my metric perturbation. I've just uh, expanded it in terms of creation and addition operators that I can always do. And uh, as I was just saying that at large distances, what you can show is that this phase factor oscillates very rapidly, right? The R, the spatial component of this phase factor. So if you have this E i p dot x, I can just write it as say i, say p has some energy omega. So let's just call it p0. I'll have some i p0 x0 or u. And then I'll have some p0 times r times p cap dot x cap, right? And at large r, this part oscillates very rapidly, right? So my integrals sort of has a saddle point when these two are at the same angle, OK? So that will basically tell me that uh, th th that is the statement as I was making before, that the momentum and the direction of the particles are sort of related. So if you give me what at what z z bar my particle ends up at, I can tell you what is the momentum of the particle, which will ultimately help me in reducing this full integral only to some this whole momentum integral to only the integral over this p zero, okay? And what I'll finally get is something of this sort. Oh, and that will uh, it you can also show that uh, if I do some this sort of particular parameterization, some parts of this epsilon mu nu actually goes to 0. And you can actually show that this is equal to minus 0 to infinity d of omega p, where omega p is just this p0 times a minus.
Okay, so this is what my CZZ actually looks like. Sorry. You want pH to align with x hat, right? Right. So pH yeah, yeah, yeah. minus one. Sorry. Thanks. Yes. Okay. So if this is my CZZ, then you can sort of convince yourself. And it's a small algebra, so because I don't have much time, so I'll leave it as an exercise. That integral over du u nzz, okay, where nzz is nothing but del u of czz, that can be written as this epsilon minus zz limit omega goes to zero. 1 plus omega del omega times a minus minus a plus tag. Okay. Okay. And what that basically tells you is that it creates a graviton. Okay. But if you want to take omega goes to 0 limit, it projects out the 1 over omega pole because this operator does that. This omega, this operator picks out only the omega to the power 0 component of it. And it sort of creates a positive helicity. Yeah, a positive hel helicity graviton and this. It sort of annihilates a negative helicity graviton. Okay, but that omega goes to 0 limit. So basically it creates a soft graviton. Is that clear? Did that? It creates a soft graviton, but the point is because of this operator and this omega, go, omega goes to zero limit, it projects out the leading part of that soft graviton. So it's, you can think of it as it creating a subleading soft graviton. Okay. Some yeah, they are producing some particular helicity, right? This is what it does. Yes. That comes from the fact that I have uh, look, like I have taken this saddle point approximation that p dot x is zero. Okay. And that will tell you that uh, as as you go to large r, some helicities will actually go to zero, and some will just stay. So this is what that. No, you can have c z z bar z bar also, right? So if you have that mode, that will create the other other helicity. Okay. So what I'll do, I'll, I'll just briefly sketch the proof. Sorry for going over time. Yeah. Huh. No, no, no. Uh, so I'll just finish it in 10 minutes. The proof is not that much. Like there are some algebraic details, but I think I can leave it. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, okay. If you guys want, we can take a tea break. Like, but I'll just really take 10 minutes. Like, my 10 minutes are not like Devangshu's 10 minutes. So. <laughs> so, okay, yeah, okay, fine, fine. So, okay, so, uh, no, it's fine. So, what I'll do is that I'll uh, prove that uh, my subleading soft graviton theorem actually proves. Uh, this word identity that I just showed you earlier, and then I'll give you, I guess, some motivation as to why there should be a 2D CFT. Okay, but at least that will prove you that super rotations are actually physical symmetries of the system, and then I'll tell you that why do you think that that is related to super super uh, sorry 2D CFTs, and then Partho can take over and talk about more about the structures of 2D CFTs and so on and so forth. Okay, yeah, sure, thank you. <laughs>